Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I want to start by uh, thanking the Rochester General Hospital Association for making it possible to uh, bring in speakers from all over the country and big name speakers, and we've brought in many over the years, as you all know. And today it gives me great pleasure to um, have an outside speaker who I happen to have known for 46 years. Sanjay and I were medical school classmates uh, at, um, at a very young age. We went straight from high school to medical school, 17 years old. We were uh, roommates uh, in CMC Valor. So he and I shared a 100 square foot uh, little room. Um, I, I tried to look back uh, for old pictures from back then, and I found nothing before 1979. So this was Sanjay in 1979. And I think this was the year, or maybe the very next year, that he got married to this lovely young woman who was also our classmate in medical school and is here in town doing surgical grand rounds at the University of Rochester this morning. She's a vascular surgeon. Uh, but I asked Sanjay to send me a picture so we could put it up on a poster. And here's what I got. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we had to go on the web and <laughs> found something a little bit more uh, respectable. Uh, <laughs> So Sanjay has been at the uh, Mayo Clinic for 25 years, where he's associate professor of medicine and has developed an expertise in interstitial lung disease, has people come see him from around the world for this. And so without taking away any more of his speaking time, I give you Dr. Sanjay Kavra. Good morning. Uh, in my defense, I was traveling in India when he asked me for that picture. I had no other choice but to take one on the spot. And that was uh, the Taj Mahal. So it was the, the, the location was special anyway. Uh, I, I think uh, you, you already understand why this is a unique pleasure. Uh, Dr. Parak Prad, PDP as we called him then, uh, was, was, was my roommate for a whole year. And he, he's, as you know, the quietest, gentlest, smartest person most people in the room know. Uh, but he has this unfortunate liking for Jethro Tull, which he played 24. <laughs> and, and I had to listen to that for every day, 24 hours for a whole year while we were roommates together. But it, it, I bring you greetings from the other Rochester, but the smaller Rochester where, where uh, a, a little clinic called the Mayo Clinic exists. I've been there 25 years. And uh, let's see if we can make some sense of this complex group of diseases called uh, the interstitial ones. And I'm going to break this up uh, in, in, into two parts. The first is just to go through the diagnostic approach to interstitial lung diseases. So we won't actually talk about specific diseases in any particular detail, but uh, we'll instead focus on how to approach these diseases. And then the second part is uh, to highlight some of the recent changes in treatment. Uh, as, as you probably realize, even if you see these diseases only occasionally, is that they, they are an unfortunately frustrating group of diseases to treat, and effective treatments are uh, not, 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 not that widely available or, or, or in existence. So we'll, we'll try and uh, hit on the highlights over there. So first, let's define what it is we're talking about. And in general, these diseases that I'm going to refer to are, are chronic. Some of them are subacute. They're not malignant. They're usually not infectious, uh, as, as best as we understand in the conventional form of infection. And they lead to either inflammation or fibrosis and derangement of the alveolar walls. And I say inflammation and or, because not all of them are 
clearly inflammatory. They have uh, often been considered to be inflammatory in their origin, but for a large group, the inflammation part is uncertain. Certainly there is uh, uh, fibrosis, there is a derangement of the alveolar walls, and that leads to functional impairment. Uh, a, a lot of this is based, and oh, that's kind of a little scrambled, uh, on uh, the, the, the update from the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society on uh, how these idiopathic interstitial pneumonias should be classified. And here is uh, what we have so far. Um, oops. Ah, oh, I see it now. Uh, and uh, they, they, they're grouped into the major and the, and the, and the rare categories. As you can see, the, the major ones, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, makes up the, the, the bulk. And then there's a bunch of others all sharing the interstitial pneumonia component, but there's the idiopathic nonspecific, and we'll talk a bit about that, respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease, desquamative, and then these other ones. We won't say very much about these rare idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, the lymphocytic uh, or the lymphoid, or this newly described condition called in idiopathic pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, or PPFE. Uh, the, the last especially is very poorly defined at the moment, and all we know is it appears to be progressive, fibrotic, involves a certain older populations, but we know very little about it so far. And then there is, inevitably, when you have uh, incomplete understanding, an unclassifiable group. But before you get to the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, you have to weed out all the other things that look in and, and uh, behave like that. And so we'll, we'll back off a little bit, uh, both in time and in, in uh, perspective, and talk about diffuse lung disease in general or diffuse parenchymal lung disease. And with that, we start with some that uh, we recognize immediately as having an identifiable cause or association. Common among these are diseases that are associated with occupational exposure, for example, the pneumoconioses, or ones where uh, inflammation, body-wide inflammation is often associated with pulmonary inflammation as well, and the, the main group there are the connective tissue diseases. The idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, and that's what we'll come back to, make up a large proportion of these, but there are the granulomatous diffuse parenchymal lung diseases, and the most common of those is sarcoidosis. The granulomas occur, for example, in granulomatous polyangiitis, formerly known as Wegener's, also seen in hypersensitive pneumonitis, for, for example. And then there's this grab bag of other not specifically classifiable diseases. LAM is lymphangioleomyomatosis, a disease of, of, uh, usually of premenopausal women. Uh, then there's uh, pulmonary Langehans, Langehans cell histiocytosis, and finally that PPFE that I referred to earlier, which we know so little about. Within the interstitial lung diseases, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias are the ones that attract the most attention, require the most work, because the other ones you can figure out and separate. Within that group, the largest is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and a lot of what I talk about is focused on identifying IPF and separating it from all the others. And those others consist of this alphabet soup. The IP, of course, in all of them stands for interstitial pneumonia, but you have desquamative interstitial pneumonia, which is largely a disease of smokers, but may be associated with autoimmune disease. Acute interstitial pneumonia is what we recognize as, in, especially in the ICU, as idiopathic ARDS or, or ARDS. It's, it's unknown in, in origin usually, associated with certain uh, pathological changes which are mainly diffuse alveolar damage and uh, lead to acute respiratory failure and are recognized as ARDS. NSIP is about 20 years old, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Unfortunately named, if you give a disease a nonspecific name, it's going to be always considered as something not really real. Uh, actually, to be fair, it is quite real. It has an inflammatory uh, cellular pathology, which is recognizable on biopsy. It is often associated with connective tissue disease and idiopathic uh, 
is, an, is a small component of NSIP, but it, it, it can look like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis sufficiently that one has to make a great effort to separate them. And that's the reason it's only been defined in the last 20 years or so, because up to that point, it was lim lumped with IPF. RBILD is smoking-related bronchiolitis with a more exuberant inflammatory component, and we'll say a little more about that. Uh, COP used to be known as idiopathic BOOP. COP stands for cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Uh, idiopathic boop or bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia was the fashionable name till about 10, 15 years ago. And now we're going back to, uh, to, to, to the traditional top name. And LIP or lymphoid or lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia is what I said, is seen, it's rare as classified. And really all you need to know about it is it occurs in HIV, it occurs with Sjogren's and other connective tissue diseases and it can be associated with lymphomas, and that's about all that one needs to really know about LIP. But even there, patients don't arrive with a diagnosis of an interstitial disease. Uh, they often arrive with symptoms, or they arrive with abnormal imaging, or something along those lines. And you have to start with your conventional tools of history, exam, chest x-ray, etc. And within that, you're most interested in certain aspects. The, the most useful part to start out are the, the tempo of the disease, the radiological pattern, and the, especially the clinical context. And I base this on uh, a, a, a paper that my colleague J. Ru wrote nearly 20 years ago. Uh, he's still working. He broke his leg last week. I wheel him around. Uh, he's been a mentor. It's, 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 it's the snow and ice slipped on the, and, 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 and broke his leg. Uh, but he's still... Uh, a, a, a very important ILD resource that I use. So the tempo, although I said that this is a subacute or a chronic process, the ac acute conditions do intrude, and they have to be separated before you can go, go, go to work on, on, on the diseases we're talking about. And so the usual infection, hemorrhage, edema, aspiration, etc., have to be taken out. Uh, but the subacute and chronic tempo is what represents or, or typifies uh, the conditions we're talking about. So the both the, the anatomic distribution or more conventionally the radiological distribution, because that's what you're looking at, uh, is, is helpful. And uh, I won't say very much more other than to point out that if you combine lower with peripheral, you cover most of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. The majority of them are bibasilar and somewhat peripheral, often uh, directly subplural, and, and that's what makes them up. But there are others... Uh, especially sarcoidosis, for example, which is central, and uh, some which are typically upper lung. And for example, chronic hypersensitivity may occasionally have an upper lung distribution, but the pneumoconioses, especially, uh, and uh, other mimicking conditions, especially infectious, uh, and if you're in the right part of the world, TB comes, comes into that uh, category. Uh, again, PP. PPFE rears its head again. It does seem to have an upper lobe distribution. But as I said, we know so little about it that um, anything I say will probably change as we learn more and will only serve to confuse. So it exists. We, we, we don't know much about it yet. The clinical context, as in all these patients, requires clarification. Uh, connective tissue diseases have already been mentioned a few times uh, in connection with these diseases, so you really need to pay attention to their, that possibility. Uh, immunodeficiency states uh, because of the infection part, but also because of things like LIP. Critical are exposures. Occupational, uh, obviously, but uh, non-occupational exposures are often harder to get to, but, uh, and they may be subtle or, or unrecognized. And uh, within those, you really have to think of drugs. Drug-induced lung disease is, is a particular favorite of mine because it, it manifests 
in so many ways, uh, it requires a high level of clinical suspicion, and there's hardly any way to prove the point other than by the circumstances in which you see it. There are almost no drug-induced lung diseases that have a specific gold standard test that you can apply. So it's, it's observation, attention, uh, and, and suspicion, suspicion, suspicion. Um, birds and bird equivalents uh, are, are not uh, uncommon, and there are subgroups of, of people who will go to extensive lengths to hide that from you. Pigeon breeders, for example, a nice uh, subculture. Uh, they know all about uh, lung disease and uh, the hobby that they have, and they will go to enormous lengths to conceal it from you. To, 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 and, and it's often the spouse that rats them out. Uh, but uh, uh, for, so, for example, and, and birds, the equivalent is a feather pillow. A down pillow is equivalent to being exposed to a bird. And then humidifiers and hot tubs because of the molds that they grow and hot tubs, especially because of certain atypical mycobacteria that uh, produce a sort of a hypersensitivity reaction. Aspiration for obvious reasons, heart failure for obvious reasons. Uh, pummy function are typically restrictive in, the, in all these patients, which means they have low volumes, low flow rates. The volumes and flow rates are reduced in proportion. The diffusion capacity is usually reduced in proportion as well, so that's typical restriction. But there are a few interstitial diseases that have an obstructive component which may be dominant. Sarcoid, as many as 40%, may show an obstructive component. Langer cell histocytosis, the majority will do that, as will LAM. And then the problem is we don't live in a binary world. It's not either or. So it's not uncommon to have people who smoke who have COPD and who get interstitial diseases. And in those situations, obviously, you can have overlapping abnormalities and the obstruction may even dominate. So this condition called combined pulmonary fibrosis em emphysema, or CPFE, is being increasingly recognized as being rather common. The exam, as you would, uh, Velcro rolls, uh, uh, showers of superficial sounding uh, inspiratory crackles, were actually described by a colleague of mine who was hiking in the Swiss Alps, saw a, a, a big mansion perched on a hill and said, whose is that? And he said, that's the guy who invented Velcro and made millions. And he said, that's exactly what the lungs sound like in IPF. And the Velcro Rawls uh, 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 label was attached. And, and combine that with clubbing, and you, you have a high likelihood you're dealing with IPF. And then you look for other clinical evidence of, uh, of other abnormalities as well, which might give clue to underlying diseases, especially sarcoid, connective tissue diseases, and so on and so forth. The other, of course, is the x-ray. It used to be a simple world. We lived in patients came in like this, and you looked at it and said, that's IPF, and you were done. Or they came in like this, and you looked at their, the, what was accompanying, and uh, this was the same abnormality, but now it's scleroderma, so it wasn't idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Instead, it was scleroderma-associated lung disease. And that was the simple uh, world that we lived in before they, they, they created all the subcategories. Well, on the basis of what you got so far with your history and physical exam and the rest of it, you may be able to confidently say that this is not an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. I've identified a drug, environmental agents, there's a connective tissue disease, et cetera, et cetera, the patient's occupation is such, and you're done with that. But about 80, 90% of them will still remain potentially idiopathic because your initial workup didn't quite answer the question. These are the groups that your best friend is the high-resolution chest CT scan. And this tip shows some typical findings, if I can locate my pointer. So, so for example, that is traction bronchiectasis. This is traction bronchiectasis, where the airways are pulled apart by, by fibrous uh, tissue. And then along the edges here, you can see these multi-layered cystic abnormalities. And that's what's called honeycombing, or if you look at it here, even more dramatically visible. Uh, and this is honeycombing. And this is pretty much pathognomonic of, 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 of usual interstitial pneumonia, which is the prerequisite for calling anything IPF. So let's see what uh, that refers to. A typical CT scan with UIP will show subplural and basal predominant distribution but it will be marked with honeycombing with or without that traction bronchiectasis that I was talking about, or with a, a more subtle form of cystic change called bronchiolar ectasia. 
if that is present, if that honeycombing is present and there's a bibasilar peripheral distribution, even if it's somewhat heterogeneous, that's UIP. Anything short of that, especially if it lacks honeycombing, is not classical UIP, and therefore your confidence in making a diagnosis of UIP based on the CT alone falls off progressively all the way till when you have the last column with multiple atypical abnormalities of cysts, uh, ground glass opacities, ground glass opacities are hazy opacities, multiple micronodules, uh, central lobular nodules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once you have those or any other changes, for example, a dilated esophagus predicting either aspiration or scleroderma, or you have pleural plaques or things along those lines which point to a different condition, then you have to look for an alternative diagnosis. But if you've got bibasilar, subpleural, peripheral uh, changes which are accompanied by significant honeycombing, you are better than 85% likely to be able to replicate that on a surgical lung biopsy. So you're, you're pretty well off uh, with that. But not all CT scans are as dramatic as the first one I showed you. So the, here you could think that there is some hint of honeycombing. Uh, it's not typical honeycombing. There's, there's a little bit of ground glass change there. So it's not quite typical classical UIP. Or this one where the dominant abnormality, all this hazy stuff is really ground glass change. Or here, where the airways stand out a bit, there's patchy fibrosis. It's not quite typical, again, of UIP. Now, I'm showing you a bunch of these pictures just to show you the variations rather than point to a specific disease. Uh, or you have something in its potentially in its early stages where there's a little fuzziness here, uh, a, a, a little airway change here and there. It is peripheral, it is subplural but it's not accompanied by any of the classical changes of UIP. Or this one where there is honeycombing, but the striking abnormality here is the asymmetry. Uh, it's so much more on this side and so little on that, and you'd be tempted to say, this is UIP, most likely uh, based on this, but this one was actually recurrent aspiration with damage, especially to the right lower lung, for example. Uh, ground glass change again, uh, which uh, in this, instance is quite typical of these formative interstitial pneumonia, but you cannot make uh, an absolute diagnosis radiologically. Uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, and I'll, I'll highlight the, 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 the most important part. You've got this ground glass thing. Uh, the central lobular nodules project a little poorly here, but when you take expert reviews of this, this, this sort of uh, abnormality, you get what is called an accentuation of a mosaic pattern, and you get these blacker looking areas uh, alternating with uh, these, these whiter looking ones. And that suggests that those, those black areas are not emptying out properly. There's a little air trapping and hypersensitive pneumonitis is typically accompanied by some expiratory air trapping and an accentuation of that mosaic pattern, uh, which, which gives a clue to an airway centered process. Hot tub lung is a variation on hypersensitive pneumonitis. We used to see a lot of it, but now I think the word's gotten out. People are either maintaining their hot tubs a little bit better, or they're just recognizing it at other places and not bothering to send them to us, because if, at a time when it was poorly understood, they would come to us as unknowns, and we would uh, uh, link it to atypical microbacterial exposure from hot tubs, uh, and it was a hypersensitivity sort of phenomenon. And then at least one on, on drug-induced lung disease, you see these dirty lung fields with the uh, scattered scarring, nothing uh, very, very specific about it, but it's the exposure. It's the history of having used uh, an, an agent that might be responsible and, and nitrofurant on for many years was the leading cause of drug-induced lung disease. It is no longer by, by far. The oncologists have given us many other drugs instead and, 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 and I, th I think we see those more than almost anything else now, uh, drug-induced lung disease from all the new uh, chemotherapy agents is, is, is a, uh, requires books and books uh, by, by, by themselves. So you do your HRCT, and on the basis of that, you, you, you say, this is typical UIP, uh, or radiologically, I have a high likelihood of being able to say that this is indeed uh, the 
what it is, I don't need to do anything else. But about 40% or less will have that typical UIP appearance. Uh, the majority will still be atypical or maybe in a small group diagnostic for something else, or you suspect uh, some other condition without being diagnostic. And that's where the current uh, step has been introduced, and MDD stands for a multidisciplinary discussion. And when you don't have an absolute diagnosis on the test that you have up to that point, including the HRCT, the current recommendation is get a few experts together and see if they can resolve this to, to some degree of satisfaction. And my answer here is, unless it's typical UIP, having the experts will not really move it in any meaningful direction on the radiology alone. So the majority of the time, if you can't make a firm diagnosis on the CT scan, they're going to say, do something else, which is often a biopsy. Uh, and uh, traditionally, we've tended to do transbronchial biopsies uh, supplemented with bronchialveolar lavage. But I think we all recognize that except in certain conditions, and those conditions are typically sarcoid, uh, maybe uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and occasionally in hypersensitive pneumonitis. In all the other situations, especially trying to distinguish UIP from NSIP, it's not going to really answer your question with a standard transbronchial biopsy. There are sampling issues. There are size of the sample issue. Uh, it just doesn't uh, work. Uh, so you then have to think of something else. And the current gold standard, and a very tarnished gold standard, as I'll say in a few minutes, is a surgical biopsy, a, a, a VATS biopsy. Or you're going to hear more and more about this thing called a cryobiopsy, where you put in a cryoprobe uh, bronchoscopically, uh, allows you to create a little ice ball inside the, inside the lung and, and avulse the tissue, you get larger samples. So if a typical transbronchial biopsy may give you samples which are one to three millimeters in size, this may give you samples which go five to eight, five to 12 millimeters in size, uh, substantially bigger. One has to recognize that this comes at a risk, uh, especially of hemorrhage and uh, expectedly of pneumothorax. And there have been fatal hemorrhages reported with cryobiopsy. Uh, and the final answer on whether the cryobiopsy is equivalent to a surgical biopsy is still not out. There are conflicting uh, uh, data uh, and other than in expert and, if I may say, slightly biased hands, it's not the equivalent of a VATS biopsy yet. Uh, but it's certainly simpler to do than, than a VATS biopsy, it's not surgical. But in, in general, one has to weigh the risks fairly uh, closely because the possibility of a pneumothorax in a, in a patient with respiratory impairment or a major bleed are not minor considerations and may not, in some instances, be sufficient grounds to consider this a safer or a less intrusive procedure than a VATS. So once you do that VATS, uh, either you've got a slam dunk biopsy read of UIP or something else, but very often even that, and that's why I said this is a tarnished gold standard, even that may say, well, it's a cellular interstitial pneumonia, with some atypical features, and there's vague granuloma formation, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't give you a, a diagnosis that you can absolutely hang uh, a, a, a label to. And so back comes the multidisciplinary discussion. Uh, and here with the biopsy in hand, you're probably going to have a better chance of classifying these accurately but the classification has no superior authority to, to, to appeal to. Whatever the, the, the expert group says is it, because there's no higher standard that you can, you, you can apply that. There is no true gold standard. So the, the, the point is, even at the end of this, you may be in a situation where I think it's this, it may be a cellular NSIP or a fibrotic NSIP, but I'm really not sure that it's not a UIP. And therefore, you may have, some, even at the end of, your, your surgical biopsy be less than resolved in, your, in, in the label to apply. And the labels that you might apply would be the ones that uh, 
you've heard about already in my previous slides, usual interstitial pneumonia and nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, respiratory bronchiolitis with or without interstitial lung disease, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, DAD, obliterative, bronchi obliterative bronchiolitis, or constrictive bronchiolitis, and then the LIP. Or you find something else that actually settles the diagnosis and non-IIP. So what you're really hoping is to find something classical, typical. And this is a biopsy of a typical uh, thing. You can see areas of fibrosis, some normal alveolar septa here, uh, some more, more dense fibrosis here and on a higher magnification. This is what is known as a fibroblastic focus. And these abnormalities are pretty typical of usual interstitial pneumonia. But not uncommonly, you will get something else and you'll get the non the non-specific change, the non-specific interstitial pneumonia change, uh, respiratory bronchiolitis, DIP, organizing pneumonia, or DAD. And in the middle column, it links it to the clinical condition. So if you see UIP, it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis if you have satisfactorily, satisfactorily excluded connective tissue disease, asbestos disease, anything else that can produce the same sort of changes as UIP, the changes of UIP. Uh, idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia is again a diagnosis after you've excluded other things that produce nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. And my own personal feeling is, uh, and this is based on the data, that less than 20% of NSIP should be idiopathic. The majority can be attributed to connective tissue disease, drug exposures, inhaled exposures, and others. So uh, the, the, the idiopathic group should shrink uh, with, with, with effective workups, and effective workups should, uh, should be really uh, as, as aggressive as possible to reduce that idiopathic group. All the others are what they are, and DAD is what you see in AIP, which is what idiopathic ARDS is. So you've got all this, you've ended uh, your, your evaluation, and now, now what am I going to do? And as I said, at the end of that biopsy, there's still some uncertainties. There may often many uncertainties left. So really, the recommended pathway may well be to send these all to specialized centers where people uh, just see more of these. They may not necessarily know more, uh, but they've seen variations which, which allow them to be a little bit perhaps more uh, effective in, in, in classifying these disorders. Uh, if, if, if I see the, the same variation multiple times and I know how it turns out, I may be able to tell you better what the actual diagnosis is than the sporadic case that you might see. And then there are these complex decisions regarding treatment and prognosis. Treatment options are fairly limited and they are complex. And as you'll see in the next part, that there are some new emerging issues which may require the genetic uh, testing and counseling as well. So I think that's the first part, that uh, how do you approach these diseases in terms of diagnosis. Now let's spend a little time talking about uh, treatment of these and in, in the modern era, era, how can you have a talk that doesn't have a tweet uh, mentioned in it? So I... It, this, this, this is, any, anybody who deals with interstitial disease has seen this particular, uh, uh, this Kaplan-Meier survival curve in at least once in every paper that's, that's published on the subject. This, this, again, uh, Jay Ruha mentioned broken his leg. This was uh, him and uh, a fellow at that time, Julie Broker. And this is a seminal description of how interstitial lung diseases behave. And the highlight from this is 50% survival at this level uh, matches out to about three years. And so the median survival for UIP has been widely accepted at being around three years. And that in itself hides these, potentially these four patterns of decline. There is the patient who declines very slowly and may never get into trouble. And actually, I just had my oldest patient with IPF die in late December. He lived to be 90. He was diagnosed in his early 70s. His brother had the same disease. Uh, 
uh, and died in his early 70s. But this particular uh, man lived 18 years after the diagnosis. And the only thing I did for him was tell him not to do anything. Uh, so, so it worked out pretty well. Uh, but uh, so some, some will have a, a very slow decline. Others will have a stuttering decline like this one. Some will have a steady uh, progressive decline over years and some will crash and burn very, very, very abruptly. So, so that, that, that median survival of, of uh, three years uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is an aggregate of uh, these, at least these four patterns of decline. So because of that, you, 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 you have to have some sort of strategies as to what you're going to do with these patients. So in some of these interstitial lung diseases, the decline may be small, and these may be self-limiting diseases or reversible. In those, if there's, a, if, if there's something that's provoking it, a drug, smoking, whatever it may be, perhaps your only intervention needed is to remove the possible cause. Uh, in some, there is the possibility of reverse, reversibility, and the inflammatory uh, cellular ILDs may be that. There may be some way to, to, to either reverse or stabilize and then continue to treat if needed. And so on and so forth, uh, you either maintain status or stabilize. But in this last category, which is IPF, which forms the bulk, unfortunately, we recognize based on all that data out there that there is actually an inexorable progressive decline. And uh, there, even if it does it slowly, it will continue to worsen. And that then forces one to look for treatment. I started out and I had uh, 10 slides here telling you about all the major trials that many of which gave an initial hope of success and then failed. But instead, I took Ganesh Raghu's uh, combined one and this lists all the trials we've seen, and this lists only the placebo controlled trials. So there were nearly 3,000 in the placebo groups, and I'll work you around in, in a clockwise fashion. Uh, so there was mastentin, warfarin, n cysteine with azathioprine. I'll, I'll, I'll pause briefly for that one. There was a major European trial called the Iphigenia trial, which actually showed a substantial benefit with a combination of NAC, n cysteine, and antioxidant is a thyperin, uh, combination. And the, the, that trial was interesting. Almost nobody died in that trial. Uh, the, it seemed to have a more benign course overall than, than the usual IPF we see. But it was unequivocally a positive trial, which led to other trials, uh, including this thing here called the Panther uh, uh, IPF trial, which was done in the United States. And that not only showed that there was no benefit, it actually showed a higher mortality in the treated group and had to be prematurely discontinued. Uh, so so that, that, that was the one promising uh, treatment that failed. And astralcysteine is, has been tried in many forms again. Uh, Bosentin, like mastentin here, has been tried in, in thing. A colleague of mine, uh, now, uh, now deceased, uh, did the colchicine trial uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, had, had entirely negative results. Uh, a colleague of mine, as a fellow and as a young staff, uh, had this major multicenter trial on imatinib because it looked promising, didn't go anywhere. And then I'll take you around all those if I think. But really, only two trials, only two, two agents have so far shown some promise. The first is nintedinib. And the other is profenadol. In actual fact, the first is profenadol, and the second is nintendinib in historical terms. And those are the ones we'll talk about a little bit. The profenadol story actually goes back over 20 years. Uh, Ganesh Raghu in, in Seattle actually reported uh, an, an open label uh, uh, follow up on, on about 30 patients. And there was a hint that they deteriorated slower than the untreated patients of that historically matched controls. But you know, it was, it was a, an, an open label uh, uh, report. It wasn't uh, uh, matched with, with in, in any uh, control fashion. And it was, it was noted that the results weren't considered dramatic and it faded for a while. Uh, Profenadone, uh, which is originally a Japanese drug anyway, uh, 
was then re, uh, revived uh, about 10 years ago by, by this group of the Japanese investigators. And they did a dose ranging study with a high dose and a low dose. And you can see, compared to placebo in the in, in thing, that there was a slower rate of decline uh, based both on the FVC decline here as well as on the progression-free survival. So it showed some promise uh, with, with that. Uh, that uh, sparked sufficient interest to lead to major multicenter international trials. And uh, two of those had to be done for, for FDA approval because the FDA requires a minimum of two trials. And, and here are data from those. So the two trials were the ascend and the capacity. But basically, the first one is decreased FBC or death as the endpoint. And you can see the placebo group in the light blue greatly underperformed compared to the active drug. Uh, change in FVC graphically was clearly different between the profanadone group and uh, the, the placebo group followed out to a year. Uh, similarly, the, the six-minute walk distance or death, it seems uh, uh, an, an odd combination of endpoints, but uh, there must have been statisticians involved. Uh, but, uh, and, 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 and finally, progression-free survival. But you can see that with a, with a sizable number of patients, in two, uh, across two trials, over 600 uh, in, in active and placebo groups, there was a slower decline in loss of function. And then the combined data also showed that all-cause mortality as well as disease-specific mortality was somewhat better, uh, reduced by half all-cause and by nearly two-thirds uh, for, for disease-specific mortality with this. Uh, so certainly it was... A, this seem, seem to be effective in, in, in its own way. The same issue of the New England Journal had uh, a competing drug published, so this was the same uh, issue of the New England Journal, had one on nintendinib. Nintendinib is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is a triple angiokinase inhibitor. Uh, it, it, it came out of the oncology world, uh, but, but it, uh, it affects platelet-derived growth factor, it affects connective tissue growth factor, and it interferes with VEGF. Uh, so so it, 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 it has some antifibrotic and, and uh, uh, potential, at least. Uh, and, and it uh, was also tested, two trials in pulses one and two, as mandated by the FDA. And the first one shows you the, the drop in uh, vital capacity over, uh, over a year. And there's about 125 cc uh, lesser drop in the treated group. Uh, similarly, the, uh, so that's the, the in, in, in both graphically, oh, oh, it shows you the same, uh, uh, the, the same loss, the same slower loss of uh, function. And importantly, this one showed uh, a, a decrease in time to first exacerbation. Uh, in, in pulses one did not show that, but the second group did show that the patients on placebo were more likely to exacerbate uh, sooner than, uh, than, than uh, the retreated group. So that, that was another add-on suggesting promise. And uh, you don't really need to go into this, but the main difference in exacerbation frequency was in the, was in the patients who were more impaired, had an FPC of less than 70% predicted. Uh, and you can see that the patients who were in uh, in, in, in a, in a, who had less severe disease uh, had a lesser difference in their exacerbation frequency, which is not surprising. Uh, this led to the introduction approval of both, the, both these uh, agents in the United States. Actually, they were approved the same day, published the same day in the New England Journal, and the FDA granted approval to both of these disease, uh, both of these drugs on the same day. And surprise, surprise, they cost exactly the same as well, $94,000 a year uh, in the United States. So it's... It, it, it. But as, as you saw from, from the last one, uh, the, the question then comes up, if, 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 if these are more effective in reducing exacerbation in those who are more severely impaired, uh, what uh, is their utility? At what point in, in, uh, in disease course should you start the treatment? Should you wait till they 
get worse or should you start treatment early? And that, I think this is a, a useful uh, study from Martin Kolb uh, and his uh, colleagues. Well, this is a multicenter study. Martin is now in, uh, in Canada. He's uh, German, as you can tell, but he's at McMaster's. And uh, even in patients who had an FBC at baseline of greater than 90%, there was a slowed, uh, an equivalently slowed rate in decline, about 130 cc uh, fall annual, uh, annually in the, in the FBC, for example. So it does slow things down uh, and maybe grounds for treating early. Uh, and similarly, the exacerbation frequency uh, was different. So we'll, uh, treatment did improve the exacerbation risk. Uh, logically, then, if you say one works, uh, each of the individual drugs work uh, individually, uh, is there any value in combining them? Uh, that is an unanswered question at the moment because the only published data we have is this short uh, study where uh, patients were started on intendinib for six weeks uh, and then were, had uh, profanadone added uh, in a randomized fashion uh, for, for, for another six to eight weeks. And so we only have 12 week data so far. Uh, there should be more coming out soon. I, I've heard whispers that it's not particularly dramatically different from either drug alone, but uh, don't have the final data yet. But as you can see, the, the, the yellow line, which is the combination, had a slight divergence, a slightly slower rate of decline compared to nintendinib alone. But as I said, 12 weeks is really insufficient and the number of patients is also insufficient to form any firm uh, uh, opinions and uh, the combination is doubly expensive. So this, this really comes to a, to, to a philosophical question almost. When you're dealing with a disease that is progressive, you feel obliged to treat it with whatever you have at hand. But if what you have at hand does not actually reverse the dysfunction, but instead only slows the rate of progression, how do you tell that it's working in an individual patient? And my own answer to that is actually you cannot tell. Uh, and because you cannot tell, and the patient may continue to decline and get frustrated uh, without recognizing any change in the slope of decline, how do you convince yourself, and more importantly, how do you convince the patient to perse persevere with the treatment that has side effects, is expensive, and is not visibly working? Uh, it's, 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 it's a problem, and I, it, it, it's something I've struggled with because I found myself in the early part of these drugs being available as often spending more time stopping the medication because patients were frustrated or couldn't afford it or had side effects or a combination of those rather than spending time trying to convince them to take it even if they could not tell that it was working. So you need metadata basically, you need pool data and there are a couple of reports out there, I just picked the most recent uh, mainly because one, one, one of our fellows published this uh, recently so uh, Tim Dempsey and uh, is, is, is a fellow in our program at the moment. So this is a recent paper. Does it work? Uh, does it work as it, 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 in, in a population? And they used uh, the Optum uh, database uh, with 8,000 some patients with IPF uh, and uh, looked at patients who were treated with either of the antifibrotic medications and did uh, a propensity matching uh, with, uh, with, with the control population to see what happens and looked at all cause mortality. The numbers are significant, but because it's, 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 it's a database, it's not perspective, it's, it, it, and you don't know what factors you haven't controlled for, it's, it, it is somewhat suspect. But their conclusions were that among patients who have uh, received antifibrotic agents, there is a reduction in the all cause mortality and in the hospitalization uh, in, in, the, in the treated group. And that's the best data we have at the moment, combined with that question that I raised, how do you tell in, in, in any given patient whether you're, with this drug is doing any good? That, uh, so at the moment, based on what I'm thinking is, it may be worth trying to convince people to continue to take treatment uh, 
in addition to starting treatment early based on some of the earlier data, that rather than getting frustrated along with the patient and suggesting that treatment be stopped for less than good reason. I mean, if there are obvious significant side effects, then there are ample grounds to either stop treatment or at least switch to the other agent. But as far as possible, my bias is increasingly shifting towards encouraging people to continue treatment as the group effect suggests that this may actually be useful. Okay, a couple of minutes on uh, treatment of autoimmune disease. There's no control data out there, uh, really, except for these, uh, these two scleroderma trials. The first one was with cyclophosphamide, showed a marginal but statistically significant benefit. Uh, uh, it, was, it was met with great acclaim when it came, but we're still scared to use cyclophosphamide without real good reason, so it doesn't. But Nintendib has recently been approved for systemic sclerosis based on a major trial, which again showed some reduction in the rate of decline. The others are isolated reports, microphenolate in rheumatoid arthritis associated lung disease, for example, and uh, tacrolimus uh, in uh, antisynthetase, especially polymyositis sort of uh, disease thing. And we don't have much other than historical data that anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive treatment works in these diseases, so we keep using it. Now, a slight shift in the last three slides we, we've gone through, you, you go through a clinical checklist, you have autoimmune disease, you have other systemic disease, et cetera, et cetera. But what we haven't been asking re until recently is, could there be something else going on which we haven't paid any attention to? And that particular thing is, is there a family pattern here? Familial palmy fibrosis has been recognized for years. We know it exists. This 90-year-old patient that I mentioned had a brother who died from it uh, as well. So familial uh, fibrosis is not uncommon. Uh, but it is increasingly being recognized that it is also associated with other non pulmonary uh, abnormalities uh, and premature graying, uh, what's been called cryptogenic or fibrosing liver disease, uh, cryptogenic cirrhosis, uh, aplastic anemia or mild dysplasia, and under aplastic, I guess, there's some other variants that one could include. So bone marrow dysfunction, liver dysfunction, fibrotic uh, process, others. And it is intriguing, but not proven yet, that perhaps the answer may lie in part in what the telomeres are doing. Uh, co colleagues of mine in hematology in uh, Rochester had this review. But basically, they're talking about, and I'll, I, I, I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a molecular biologist, I'm not even a hematologist, so I'll give you the, the layman's version. Uh, the, 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 these, these, these three areas of interest, RTL1, a couple of uh, other tel telomere-associated uh, genes and mutations, and then TERT and TURK, they seem to be involved in many manifestations of premature aging. And this one, especially RTL1, has been associated with various types of fibrosing lung disease and are major abnormalities in something which is associated with fibrosing lung disease, which is dyskeratosis congenita, which has a prominent lung process and where this particular one is not only abnormal, but when it is, uh, that mutation is present, it is especially present with this HHS, or is the hoyler herdasen syndrome, which is an accelerated acute uh, manifestation of, dis uh, of, of uh, dyskeratosis. Uh, so, so this particular one uh, is, is get, getting some attention uh, from, from uh, uh, people who, who work in, in, in that field. And uh, to, in, in a simplified way, what we're beginning to see is that there are a bunch of mutations out there. Some of them are rather common. Uh, mach 5 b pops up all the time. Tollip, you'll hear over and over again now. And it may have something to do with the discordance in the anastyl cysteine trials, certain tollip mutations predict responsiveness and non-responsiveness to NAC, for example. So, so that, that's uh, an area of, uh, of active interest. But this group here, these rare variants, are perhaps where the money truly lies, where uh, they, they are rare, but they, they may have huge clinical impact. And so this is where the focus is shifting, and this is where 
uh, we may actually find the answers that have eluded us so far. Uh, and uh, this then leads to a reconstruction of, of what's going on. You have the predispositions which are age related, either actual aging or premature aging, your various environmental influences, the, 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 the buzzword I guess now is becoming the exposome, which is uh, everything that you're exposed to. Uh, and, and that combined with the various things happening within you, normal healing takes care of things, but if you've got these, maybe you age prematurely, you don't heal, instead you inflame and scar, and you end up with fibrosis diseases in the lung, liver, and uh, bone marrow. And so that, that's uh, the, 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 the way things seem to be trending at the moment in terms of, of curiosity. I don't know where it'll lead. Uh, and there, there's a bunch of mutations out there. Uh, as you can see, multiple syndromes of interest to lung doctors, the Berthog Dubé, the tuberous sclerosis lamb complex, uh, and familial IPF, uh, and, and all of these are now beginning to be incorporated into the bigger uh, pomifibrosis interstitial pneumonia uh, complex. And so, I think that we're, we're, we're watching the potential of a, of a change in, in, of a major change in the way we approach these diseases in the, in the short term future. And uh, I hate the word idiopathic, so the sooner that becomes history, uh, the better. But I don't think that it'll happen in my career. Uh, but that's the only way we're going to change uh, the, the prospects of treatment. So thank you very much.